All right, here we go. Count down in five, four, three, two, and one. Mr. Joe Simmons, welcome to Cam Talks. Good morning. How are we? Good, 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 good morning, sir. I am very well indeed. Thank you very much. And it's uh, it is a good morning because we've been waiting to do this for a while. I think we may have tried to do a podcast a few years ago, um, mm -hmm. but uh, but but much more exciting things are happening these days, right? Well, I, I think so. I think there's some exciting things on the horizon. Uh, yeah, it's been a it's been a fun couple of kind of months, half a year, so. So, Joe, um, if anyone is actually listening to this, which I hope they are. Um, but obviously they they may not know who you are. They probably don't even know who I am. Uh, if you are just someone uh, from halfway around the world who's accidentally clicked on this link, then please stay with us because uh, you might find out a bit more about this wonderful man, Joe Simmons. Joe, give me a bit of a rundown who you are, you know, like it's like a, a pitch for a million dollar movie. Okay, you know. Well, yeah, I'm Joe. Um, I am a filmmaker from Yorkshire. I started making films when I was... I think 21 and then now I'm 31 so it's been 10 years woohoo um I it's been a fun one I think that I, I started as an actor and then found filmmaking uh and yeah I've just made lots of uh lots of films I'm, I, I probably I work tend to work in a similar sort of genre which is kind of um kind of philosophical science fiction horror thriller that sort of life that's me Joe, you have made more short films than anyone I've ever known, or probably will know. Do you know how many short films you've made in your life? No, uh, I, <laughs> I lost count now. I have no idea. Um, I think it's mainly, but I, I think the way that I see it though is that there's lots of those films that aren't the aren't things that I want to scream and shout about. Lots of them are, you know, the analogy I, I like to use is kind of like drawing. You know, when you're starting making things, you need to figure out what it is that you like and what your taste is. And I think that lots of the, the, the films that I made in the past were just really trying to figure out my own grammar and trying to figure out the things that I wanted to make. And okay, but, to make. But, but if you could put a, a number on it, because I, I think I counted once. I think it was somewhere in the 50s. Yeah, I think it's probably 60-ish for now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the fifty that I but, could find when I ax when you accidentally gave me access to your Vimeo account, I was like, "Oh, look, there's like fifty fucking short films here." And then you're like, "Actually, there's another ten that never even made it onto Vimeo." Oh no! And now, and now they've all been curated as well. So like, they, <laughs> they all the all the fifty or sixty that were just like lots of them were just like big Boris stealing, jumping, getting a DSLR and cutting something together, and it'd be like, "Oh, that was terrible." Uh, we go on to the next one, make the next one, make the next one. So yeah, it's. It's really how fun. does how does that sort of change though? You know, from from being a one man band who's just happy to go out there and, and make films to obviously now working with big big you know big crews and and really experienced people. I mean, how has your methodology changed over over the course of what nearly sixty short films? Well, I would say the big thing is is, is communication. I mean, again, I think when you understand what you're looking for, because I I've had to do you know had to write, produce, direct, edit uh ad most of the things that i've made in my in the past you understand how to schedule you understand how to plan you understand how to communicate with people in different departments and then when you do get the opportunity which i have which has been so wonderful to have collaborators that can take some of those pressures away from you the way that you communicate from those experiences really help you create this sense of like a uh, team because even though you know it, it comes from the director or comes from the writer director it's a it's a massively a team endeavor filmmaking so having people around you that you can just trust um so yeah i would say that that's how it's changed for me which is it's just been an evolution in in the way that i communicate uh and then trusting people uh that i think are brilliant in their work so obviously the ultimate goal is to work on bigger productions uh you know more money um, yeah. You have uh, you've you found a way to 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 get onto to to big productions as as what a shadowing director is. I mean, it's it's an amazing sort of term yeah. that you're shadowing the bigger directors. What does what does that even mean? Yeah, yeah. What's your job when you do this stuff? Well, I mean, it's just be, you're being a student. I think that the when it comes to directing as a role, it's unlike writing and directing tend to be uh, quite dogmatic. You're either kind of are or you're not. 
um because you'll be making stuff of variable quality and you're building your cv to to take that role whereas then you know if you're a producer or you're a sound engineer you can start as different roles and then work up a tree i think when it comes to directing you're trying to figure your way through uh what is a, a vast amount of other directors and so the best way to do that with the shadowing for example i did the directors uk inspire program last year with um, uh, a mentor a guy called Tom Shankland, who did um, SES Rogue Heroes, uh, and I was uh, I was in Sicily for two weeks shadowing um, our Netflix series called The Leopard. Um, and while I was shadowing, I just learned a huge amount about uh, professional etiquette, really. And you know, he was very kind. He took me all the way from uh, pre-production um, in kind of January, then went through and we, we did the shoot for two weeks. It was uh, May and June, I kind of, towards the end of May, early June, where I was in Sicily, and then they continued on. And then after that, we talked through post and all that sort of stuff. So what it meant to be a shadowing director in that situation was to just be closer to a really high standard of directing uh, and a high level of process that I can bring into my own work. And I can also show to producers and people that are asking uh, or wanting to understand competency that they can then obviously I've got Tom as a reference to somebody who'll be able to vouch for me but also I know that it it kind of affects the way that I work as a creative as well so yeah it was an amazing opportunity to to shadow but uh, yeah the, the 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 tree for a director I didn't realize until quite later it's influenced quite a lot by more senior directors. So senior directors rather than producers give the opportunities to young directors. Well, it's a combination of the two. Uh, the um, the small senior directors will uh, maybe be able to offer an olive branch to either shadow or to maybe even second unit directors. Obviously, when you shoot something on main unit, you're going and you're getting um, the kind of core coverage with the uh, performers that are there. But if you miss shots, you sometimes need directors because the main director's going off and doing the next series of scenes. But if you've dropped inserts or establishing shots or anything else that might be needed for the edit, second unit director will come in and they will, um, yeah, they, they will get the other shots for you in the style that the director has specified. So, um, and that's sometimes an opportunity that um, a, uh, a a more junior director can take from a, um, from a more senior director. So yeah, I learned a lot about um, actual kind of hierarchy in film and TV. Uh, through that process but yeah it was a fantastic time did you ever find yourself uh thinking you know oh this is how i would do it you know did you ever did you ever start thinking actually maybe he's doing it wrong but i can't quite say anything i don't i i think i it was it was interesting because i think that um tom as a as a creative was was such an amazing person to learn from because i knew because he sent me all of the storyboards not storyboards i like mood oh. boards and uh, I saw some shot lists and stuff like that. So I knew how we was going about it. And what was nice is because I, I was, I, I, you know, I can't believe how much I was trusted in that situation. Uh, I was in the triangle. I, I was hearing the conversations of the triangle. And if you, uh, the triangle would be the director of photography, the director and the, and the first AD. So when they're on set, they're talking through how they're going to go through things. And it's there's three different people talking three different languages there. One's talking performance and, and director, uh, but that's also linked to to camera and lighting and tone and feeling. And then the first AD is thinking, well, you've only got a certain amount of time in your day. So it was interesting watching how um, creative um, solutions were kind of uh, came up. And obviously, they, you can have initial plans, but then you're figuring out how you also work with uh, the space, the performers. So it was. It was a real masterclass in understanding how to use everything that you have uh, to to get the best result that you can, and that was always very fluid on set. Um, but yeah, it was it was really interesting to 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 watch and see how, even though the process is also like as a really a big jump from the level that I'm at to where Tom is. I mean, Tom is in his mid fifties and I'm thirty, uh, and that's uh, you know twenty years of, of fantastic experience. Um, but actually, the process is still the same, though. You know, you're still going out and you're trying to get as many shots as you can in a day. They're the standard that you want to tell the best story that you can. And that's all it is. As even if you go up, it's just story and uh, and your skills to be able to tell that story. And what I want to just move on to now, then, is um, tell me a bit more about what is the next stage for you, then? Because traditionally, filmmakers are quite old. They're quite experienced. And uh, we're both 31 years old, right? 
I think we are in the age where we're both 31 years. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Um, I, I, I I'm think glad. I'm glad that we established the age because that's uh, you know, that's that shows maturity. That's it. Well, hopefully not too much maturity. Um, <laughs> you, know, you can't be that mature, man. I just I just no. spoke about things that I should never have spoken about. No, about. no, no. I mean, that's probably going to get cut <laughs> out, isn't it, really? We uh, can't cut anything out. No, nothing gets cut out of this podcast. It just goes It just goes live. So goes you know, straight online. Um, straight online no, so baby. I'll be very careful what I say. Um, I, <laughs> um, so next next stage for me, and it's an interesting one because I think I, I have, you know, I'll put my cards on the table. It's something that I've struggled with because I think filmmaking is a um there is a there is there are a couple of trees in the way that i understand them uh and basically i've got to the top well, not not the top but like i'm i'm at a place where i understand the short film world in in a way that gives me a certain sense of security in terms of i know that i can make a short film i understand short film uh, budgets and, and the way that they um correspond with the, the sort of thing that you can expect to get with certain budget levels um, and so the next step for me is to figure out how I jump from uh, good short form content and uh, kind of recognized um, short form content to then going into longer form content. Now, the the two options that you have, I think, as a director, you either make a very good uh, feature film and that allows you to be able to jump into making features in television, or you find a way to start as a television director on a, on a show that is um that it is kind of meant for new directors to come into to get experience to then move up the different types of shows. Uh so you most most directors in the UK will start directing things like Doctors or Casualty or uh any kind of Emmerdale, Coronation Street, blah, blah, blah. And you'll get in at that level, which is a very hard level. It's a very uh, taxing job because you are whereas as you get further along, along in the kind of high-end television, you have more time and more money and more creativity. With uh, with doing the soaps, you're gonna, you have to work with two or three cameras at a time. You have uh, very, very tight schedules. You have to block pretty complicated action. You have to, you can't work uh, as um, hard on the performance to sit down and really try and work through intention, that sort of stuff. So. Yeah, there's there are that's the the balance for me now, which is figuring out how to jump from short form to to long form. And so the way that I can help bridge that gap for myself is to um is to a uh, try and make those introductions and try and have those conversations with um, those um, creatives that can give me an opportunity, uh, or I can do what I also do, which is or which is you know I will try and generate opportunities for myself because I'm a writer as well as a director. And then I also like to co-write as well. So I'll, I'll you know, find writers that I really enjoy their own voice. Uh, I love working with story and I, I tend to kind of be involved in the story process. And then we will develop something to then try and pitch for financing to be able to then be the longer form content that is essentially proving that I can direct and then I can get more opportunities off the back of that. So that's I, I my think, plan. I think we we already know you can direct, Joe. Uh, you're a very good director. The um, the reality, though, for, for people of our generation and our age is that, mm. you know, it's an incredibly competitive industry and that, yeah. you know, lots and lots of people can do it. Um, so there's always the need to make money, you know, making money as a filmmaker, um, you know, you've always got the opportunity to work uh, for, for the brands. And uh, and recently you, you did some charity work. Why don't you tell me a little bit more about the obviously the the charity work paid uh, money, which is amazing. Hurrah, you're being paid for the very job that that you love doing. Um, and, yeah. and I guess that that that's how you kind of like keep yourself afloat whilst trying yeah. to get these narrative dramas off, off the floor. So yeah, how did that come about? So yeah, um, I, um, I, I am rep by a commercials company in London called Great Guns and uh, I was working there uh, and I did a couple of, I was working as a producer and a director and that was coming on my first introduction into kind of making uh, more commercial length stuff. So make kind of maybe sub two minutes, sub 90 seconds um and then from there i was just i was looking for something else i, I they the, the commercial company was were pushing a um a piece of work that i made in the unreal engine which was great and a really you know fun project the very, music very video. yeah yeah um but that that was really difficult to sell because i think it was new technology and um 
and the level of finish kind of made it kind of that I could semi be qualified for work that's kind of in the regions of hundreds of thousands of pounds. But when you are a commercials director, you have to it, it's just, it, you have to prove quite a lot to producers and agencies and brands and stuff that you're the right choice. So I found myself thinking I need to have a bit of a career pivot because as much as I love the Unreal Engine and and the creative capabilities of that. That is something that's a very difficult sell. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to go. Quickly, before, before we move on into the, obviously, the charity work, uh, yeah. Unreal Engine, for people that don't understand what Unreal Engine is, it, it, it basically started as a game engine, right? Is that is that right? Yeah. It started as a game designing tool that filmmakers later adopted, uh, including yourself. Um, I think during the pandemic, you, you collaborated uh, with a director of photography who was stuck indoors and didn't know anything else to do so he he taught himself on real engine unbelievable with the you know the eyes of a filmmaker and then you as a director went and made a music video of him so that is that is almost animation is it not yeah yeah i mean it's a meta, i mean i have to say ben halford is such a talented man i mean it's been a really valued collaborator of mine for a couple of years and i think that he really um holds himself accountable and really wants to learn and i think that that's a really great uh trait of a trait of a creative where you you don't want to stop so he taught himself a very complicated series of programs uh he knows blender he knows um unreal engine he knows a whole bunch of, uh, of these really high-end kind of things and then we then uh, and he bought himself a, um, a motion capture suit as well so he was doing motion capture in his in his bedroom that was then translating into performance that was in the unreal engine that was of a spaceman in a in a space world and it, it completely blew my head off as first as uh, you know first time i saw it happen because i you know as a creative you're used to the restrictions that you have and you think that they're very set you know i, I you know I, I can't think about how i would make something like that without this new tool um so yeah we did that and um it ended up doing well i mean it was kind of submitted to can lions and we played at berlin um uh, international film festival but it was amazing because uh, i mean it, um, it looked video. a it looked like it was a million pounds, you know, like you know, five years ago, that would have cost a million pounds. Yeah, to yeah, I think, and it's a real testament to um, where where the technology is. So, yeah, we played at Berlin Music Video Awards and then uh, a couple of other places, but it was, um, yeah, it was it was really good. Anyway, massive segue into the question about the um, charity um stuff uh it's because i think that i found myself getting stuck in figuring out because i think uh the uh, the film industry obviously you, it's a business at the same time as being a, a somewhere for your creativity and your art um and people buy what they can see and i think that i hadn't shown the type of work that i wanted to sell i, I thought i could be sold for uh so i thought actually i i really love working with people i um, and the opportunity came through Media Trust uh, and the City Bridge Foundation to um, direct a commercial for uh, a, bra a really amazing charity called Arts for All. Very luckily, actually, we are uh, we've been uh, we're a finalist uh, at the Smiley Awards on uh, it will be uh, the twentieth twentieth so on in, uh, on Wednesday. So I'm going down to the Leicester Square and we've got a big. Uh, big do and everything like that so that'll be fun congratulations um, man thanks uh, so yeah it that that was really lovely as well to be able to again work, work with work the same cinematographer and a very small crew but yeah no really try to capture the 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 tone and the feeling of of uh these amazing people all the volunteers and uh and um, so what um, what was the, the the charity about and and how did you go about uh making this commercial for them Sure. Um, so Arts for All is a um, a charity based in Shoreditch, uh, which is a uh, basically they create a safe environment for uh, um, adults with learning difficulties and uh, and young children uh, after school to come and just be creative, which I, I loved as a story. And I think that I just it wasn't any more complicated than just, you know, we had a, we had a um, you know, talking head set up where we just had, to, you know, uh, people kind of talking about what it was that we had the founder and another volunteer. And then uh, the, the guys who, who, who go to arts for all, you know, the kids and the, and the adults with special um, uh, learning difficulties, they, they then got on camera as well. And we're just talking about how much they love the place that they love to go and feel safe. And I think that that was all I wanted to do, which is just to, you know, be a, basically a fly on the wall and 
the the tone and the feeling of that place was is the reason why this it's, it's been a successful um ad it's because it's just them so i think that that's what i wanted to do which was just to shine a light on them and i think that that's what happened i think it's ended up being really helpful for the charity and, and it's um yeah that I mean, it really it's actually more, it's more amazing to me because you you know you you work with ben helford as you, as you mentioned he is yeah. a fantastic dp so Obviously, uh, you know, if you are a self shooter and you go to these, you know, uh, you know, these charities by yourself, you're you're thinking, you know, lighting, you're thinking interviews, you're thinking everything. But was there some kind of luxury sort of being able to, you know, to to rely on Ben and trust Ben oh. to sort of capture the the video and you just kind of get to be the visionary? Yeah, no, and what it goes back to what we were talking about earlier on, which is about um, trust and 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 really feeling like you've got collaborators that you can. Um, give responsibility to knowing that they will they understand your vision and understand how you like to make things i've made i don't know how many projects now with ben uh i'm very grateful uh you introduced and ben I, to I, me as well which which is great because ben yeah. is, is the, the director of photography on sunrise and, uh, and he uh, he's such a i think it's really lovely to have a, a collaborator and a friend as well that, mm. that really wants to, he he's a, he will always ask good questions and always wants to press to get the best thing that you can. But when it came to the charity commercial, it was genuinely like I, you know, he was on a, an EV rig, which is you know with a little kind of pokey thing out, and he was holding the camera. And I just said to him, just go find nice moments that really feel candid. I mean, very helpful that Ben also has a background in documentary photography, uh, and uh, and you know actually studied as a wildlife photographer. Um, so he's got a real sense of observing um, non-scripted stuff. So it's just knowing in that situation that you can trust somebody to just go off and help you tell a story. So lots of it was me acting also as a producer, just trying to make sure everyone, everyone felt comfortable. And I just wanted the um, the, the vibe in the um, uh, in the kind of arts for all center, just to be like it normally is. And then for us to just go and find moments that felt uh, authentic. Mm. Um, yeah. I mean, this is really interesting because obviously, you know, the charity sector still needs money and they, they rely on filmmakers uh, like yourself to to come in and document their story. But surely now that everyone's got a camera in their pocket, uh, is 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 the, the day of, uh, you know, of needing filmmakers coming to an end? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I think but the thing, you, you know, the 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 big thing with any creativity it's about understanding that it always comes through a creative uh, and you need to have a creative vision you need to have a creative understanding um and you really i think you need a personal understanding so i think there's two words that have really clicked for me that have, have helped me unlock the way that i want to make films or make anything really which is just intention and authenticity those are the two things that are you know really important you know there's a great david mamet book which is it's called on directing on directing film uh it talks about economy you know you want you want to start with you know every film is a series of scenes which is a series of shots and i think if you understand what each of those ingredients are uh and you can defend why you're doing it that way when you really understand story and character and stuff you can make things that really feel um truthful and feel authentic to the world that you're building as long as you understand how everything kind of interacts so yeah I think that's that's really helped me um as a filmmaker make complicated decisions quite simple because you it, as long as you've got all the foundations in place and you've done the work before you get uh, onto set you can then understand what feels right um through working with your collaborators um to, to to tell the most authentic story i think so i mean it's not just the the fact that we've all got phones uh you know very high quality phones these days mm. uh now with the introduction of ai um you know we've seen recently with open ai's sora the text yeah. and video stuff i mean uh, do you think that ai is i mean i wouldn't necessarily say is it a threat to, to filmmakers uh but is it is not is it an opportunity to filmmakers I mean, it depends. It depends what sort of filmmaker that you, that you want to be in terms of the things that you want to say. I mean, I think that you know there are lots of filmmakers that will only shoot on film, you know, and, and then they shoot to digital, and then uh, you know they, they 
being creative, you have tools to be creative, and there are things that come in and that change the landscape of uh, the filmmaking world. What I would say, again, it's it's those two things. It's attention and authenticity. As a creative, you can tell the stories that you want to tell. Uh, and even if you are trying to give prompts to an AI to generate video that feels like it's got something, lots of the AI Sora stuff has no soul. There's nothing in there. It's a series of prompts that somebody has put in to make it look like something. But still, as, as, even if you're doing that, you have to get a cohesion of, um, uh, of the things that you generate. But that comes from you understanding the reason why you're making it and your, your intention as a creative, which means that you still can't cut out the human being in the kind of creation process because AI has all these opportunities like so, like a piece of blank piece of paper does. Still mm. needs somebody to pick up a pencil or a pen and figure out how to use the tool. So mm. it's a tool. Um, you, you obviously talk about that cohesion and... Um... You know the, the the thing about Sora is obviously it can create one video clip that is that is that looks like this. It can't yeah. piece together those shots and those sequences and those scenes. Yeah. So actually, we are very very far away from ever like, being able to do that. Yeah, I think also lots of it. I mean, again, people. I, I think people can feel when something feels uh, again real and it feels like it's been made by somebody that's thinking about it. I think lots of the things that are made, even by lots of people uh, that are um, that are making for uh, maybe slightly bigger studios that are trying to guess what people are trying to make and trying to guess what people might like. There is a, something intangible about the way and the soul of the thing that you've made that I think comes from real thought and care and attention that you can feel when you watch a good piece of work. When you think about the things that have resonated with you as a person, in the past uh it's because people have spent so much time thinking about the things in each individual element that that's the reason why you're connected to that particular story more than films that have spent millions and millions of pounds you know hundreds of millions of pounds making something that has nothing at the center of it that people want to watch mm -hmm. that's the bedrock of it which is like you can throw money at problems but you still need creatives to make really good decisions that feel right for the story it's no more it's no more complicated than that i think well i i i fear i fear that the complication uh mainly lies in the industry itself uh mm -hmm. you know an industry that needs to change that needs to move forwards and you know unlike the sort of uh the taxi industry where the moment uber came in it was kind of like a done deal it's like yes yeah. independent cabs are going to go uh to the side um, the film industry seems to have gone, uh, has taken a lot longer to sort of break up in a way because, you know, it's made up of so many different industries and there's mm. so many different types of production. But the one fundamental thing that I've seen that, uh, you know, since since we've been alive is the distribution model, you know, is mm. that it used to be that you'd have the the, the global uh, you know, distributors and the ability to sell your film into DVDs and to, you know, all sorts of territories. And nowadays we've got kind of like the the video on demand and the box office. And we yeah. know the box office is kind of like uh, taken by, you know, the, the blockbuster films. Yeah. And we know that video on demand is just saturated with so many, so much content. Um, yeah. How are filmmakers supposed to, once you've made an amazing film and you've, you've made a feature, how are you even yeah. supposed to, make money out of that feature these days? What is the value that you're going to have uh, associated with that film that means that you can even have a stable career? Uh, I mean, it's a good question. Uh, I, I would say that there is there are lots of <laughs> uh, <laughs> there, are, there are lots of problems with the way that the industry is looking at the moment. I think that it's very difficult to, to consistently know how, how you how you navigate w what that problem is. I, I think that you've got a very um, a very novel way of looking at this particular situation, which is really understanding from your background as a marketeer and then going transitioning and making films, uh, being able to understand what it is that you have uh, from a business perspective and understand how you push that and market that to break and cut through the noise. And I think that that's really what everyone has to have half an eye on now, which is you're not just a filmmaker, you are also somebody that's 
trying to you're a salesman as well you're trying to get something you know somebody to watch something that you've made now from my side of it it's um i i have sometimes been an ostrich on this sort of thing and just put my head in the sand and uh because i just love going from creative project to creative project and i think that it's changed for me a little bit my association with the things that i finish because i think as i said when at the beginning lots of the films that I've made felt like practices and drawing and figuring out how you go off and do the thing that you want to do with that intention. Uh, but actually going out now with uh, a plan as to what you do with a film to be able to, for it to do something. So for example, um, Vestige, uh, the, the film that uh, I made with the BFI um, and Film Hub North, that has had a very successful festival run now I need to figure out what it does to be able to help bridge the gap for me from, from short form to long form. Now, that probably is understanding what it is as a um, the, the online distribution, which will be the biggest um, uh, opportunity to get as many eyes on the project as possible. Understanding how I uh, showcase that piece of work in a way that allows me to create the most um, opportunities for myself as I can. Um, which is understanding what it is as something to to market and sell. So that, yeah, hopefully in a roundabout way, that's how I'd say we need to um, address the problem, which is just to really understand what it is that we've made and how the modern world consumes that. I mean, it still fundamentally begins with that IP, you know, with with that that first project, um, you know, Vestige. It's an amazing film, by the way. So I, you should be very very proud of it. And obviously it is sci-fi. So Joe Simmons films have never, they've never not cost a bunch of money. Um, but you've always made, you've always made them look, you know, very, very um, high, high quality for what is actually quite a very small budget. So yeah. what I'm saying is that with this short film uh, as a sort of a, a proof of concept, you're now pitching for what is it, what could be a feature film uh, of, of the short. Yeah, I mean, again, so well, what what we've done with the sh with the shorts, so, yeah, acting as a proof of concept is develop a feature film plot from Vestige. It's gonna it's gonna be called uh, Undercurrent, the feature film. And um, yeah, so we've got a pitch deck together, we've got a treatment, we've got everything like that ready, uh, having kind of packaged it up, and and we're now pushing or waiting to hear back. Actually, uh, start of next month would be whether we find out whether we get um development funding from the BFI to, to develop the script of the feature film, which would be amazing and be a huge, um, huge platform. It's a, it's a mm -hmm. you know, the BFI film four and BBC films are kind of the, 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 the standard for lots of independent filmmakers. And if you can get on through that plat a platform and go through that, and that'd be the way that you make your first feature film, it can really introduce you as a filmmaking talent uh, kind of globally, which would be amazing. But I'm also not holding my breath because it's a very, very competitive fund. It is, it is. But there's no one that deserves it more than you, Joe. Um, seriously, it's like, you know, you you don't just uh, you don't just direct. You know, you 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 sort of lead people, and I think that's that's what I found really lovely. Um, you know, having having grown up with you and seen your your sort of style of leadership, it is like you know I could cause a, an argument in an empty house. Whereas, like, I think you're very good at keeping people calm and keeping everyone on on their, their best form. And I think when you get to the level of filmmaking that you are at, where, you know, you are working with different, you know, not just different people, but different production companies, different producers, mm -hmm. different funders and stuff like that. I think you're you're absolutely the, the right sort of person. And um, it also brings me back to our very first ever encounter, which I won't dwell on the fact that uh, you do. may not have remembered me from our oh, first yeah. networking. Uh, for uh, we, Me and Joe met at a networking event in Manchester, and uh, I swear we had the best conversation. And then the second time we met, I was like, Joe, and you're like, Oh hey, what's your name? I was like, oh damn it! I thought we had really connected that one. Oh, time. don't do that! Oh no, you pulling my pulling my trousers down in front of all the, all of these people. <laughs> no, watching. listen, it's it's because you know I think we used to drink a lot back then, and um, that was back in the Manchester sort of Philmonic days. And I know you yeah. were very involved in in that community in Manchester. Uh, mm. I was yeah, you know, I was always kind of on 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 the outskirts of it. I was doing marketing. So um, I always just dipped into these networking events to try and just show my face and pretend like mm. I was a filmmaker. Um, but you really created this huge community, um, you know, of, of like minded individuals who, you know, you still see today, you know, and you, you're seeing their growth, you're seeing the way that they're coming through it all. 
And I guess the question is, you know, when you do go to film festivals and, you know, you're watching other people's work, I mean, what's the sort of vibe? Is there a competitiveness or are you just proud to be able to sort of see what they've made? Um, I mean, again, I, I think that for um, the going, going to fest festivals and trying to find, uh, you're always trying to find collaborators and opportunities. Um, and I think that, I, I think anybody would would probably be lying if you, you didn't watch things that were, you know, I'm a pretty objective of you know person that can look at my work and go, that person's made a better film than I've made, and I think that I am. I want to be the best filmmaker that I can be, and so I will be competitive, and I will look at it and go, okay, cool, that's 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 a new standard, or that's where I want to get to, and I think that. Um, yeah, I, I don't, hopefully that doesn't affect the way that I that I interact and I communicate. Most of the time, it makes me quite deferential because I think that when somebody's done something that I either don't understand or that I really respect, I want to know more. I want to talk about it, and I and I know that also like there there is a um, that something that comes from really understanding that you can only make what you can make, and other people make what they can make. Mm. And I think you can only be the creative that you are, and they can only be the creative that they are. The idea of, and I think that this is something that lots of creatives at the beginning of their careers really get, um, it really gets complicated because I think there is such a fixation on trying to figure out who you are as a creative. And I think looking at other people and even if you respect them and saying, I'm, I want to be like that person, it's an understanding that you can be influenced, but you're only going to ever be you in, in the creative process. So just accepting that as well is pretty helpful going into situations where you can compare yourself to other people it's to say well i'm only going to be able to make what i can make mm. no i really appreciate that and you know i think everyone's you know slightly competitive when when you know when you see other people doing the same thing as you with the same lack of resources with the same you know and those sort of short film festivals uh you know where you go and meet those people it is inspiring mm. um you know i remember going to can in I think it was 20, 2018, 2019. And, you know, being at Cannes felt like being on the top deck of the Titanic. It was like, you've all got got tickets to this amazing film festival, but you're all just as desperate and all destined for the the, the sink. And, uh, and, and I say that because, yeah, I do believe that the film industry needs or filmmakers need to shake up uh, their, their skill set and they need to start developing skills in marketing and sales so that by the time they get to a distributor with their amazing film, that film actually does have a commercial value to it. Um, mm -hmm. And I think in the past, commercial value did used to get um, sort of calculated through different means that it is today. And I think yeah. seeing some of the the, the sort of um, black swan moments in, in filmmaking, you know, you've had people like Jim Cummings, uh, an, an amazing filmmaker who, um, you know, whose short film Thunder Road, again, got turned into a feature film of Thunder Road. He had a very unique way of distributing that. He controlled the whole distribution model himself uh, mm. and that allowed him to keep making films. Uh, other people like the Raka Raka twins, uh, you know, the YouTubers who just made, um, what's, what's that horror film? Talk to me. Talk to me, talk to me. Amazing, amazing. These filmmakers have, have, have not just made great films, but they've come with an extra layer of attraction, whether that's they are influencers or they have influences in the film. Uh, they, they've got a route to market that is particularly different. So, yeah, I guess I, I'm also, you know, I, I'm very I'm very competitive, particularly with your with your standard of filmmaking, because I look at your films. I'm like, well, that just looks incredible, you know, and, and I'm like, well, I, I need to do better than Joe. You know, and then I'm like, and I, I find it funny because deep down, I know we're all doing the same thing. Like deep down, I know as best friends, we're all like looking at each other's work being like, oh, okay, better try harder my next time. And personally, yeah. I, I think that's great. Like, I think it's great to be able to grow with a group of people who are so talented that it kind of just pushes you to just a little, work a little bit harder, you know? No, no, I think you're totally right. I think when it, you know, we, we're very... Uh, uh, lucky we've got a, a really good group of mates that are all creative that are all going off and doing their own things and I think that you know you do need that little bit of friction where you're going you know I want to push harder you know and I think that you know it's 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 a great thing to 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 not feel like you you sit and you go this is enough because I think that I th you've got to figure out what you can do and what you can make and I think that if people around you are making you you know it's difficult because you don't you don't want to ever feel like 
pressure in, in, a, in a really negative way you know mm -hmm. I, and you know looking around and going god all my friends are doing this and i'm not doing this and i'm not doing enough and i'm not this. i think that that is a mentality that can be quite difficult to shake but i think if you're looking at it like i think we do as a group of us which is to go like I, I know that you're going off and doing things, but I, I'm, I'm proud when, when my friends go off and do things. And that makes me go, okay, cool. Well, what am I doing? And, and, and not in a negative way, but in a way that makes me feel like I want to be part of that uh, team. So yeah, I'm, I'm with you. Yeah, it, it, it doesn't feel to me like jealousy. It, it just feels like competitiveness. Yeah, yeah, yeah 100%. Yeah, but but with but with that, you know, uh, we're lucky because obviously as a group of friends, um, you know, we're filmmakers, we're actors, we're, you know, people who are, have sort of um, decided to go down that creative route, decided to mm. reject in the nine to five. And for our sins, we are cursed with the constant comparison of the best filmmakers that have ever lived. You know, when mm. we do watch the best films, we're always like, Oh, that's what we're gonna do one day, you know. But, but we're so far away from ever having that that budget and that experience to even make something like that. However, the nice thing that I find is that you know when you're in your best form and and you, you're getting a little bit arrogant and you're happy, you've got a mate who's kind of ready to just just pull you down a little bit. And then uh, and then when you're at your worst form and you you really need a hug, you've got a mate that's gonna pick you up. You know, mm. and I think that's that's kind of how like a family operates, you know, and I think in today's day and age, you know, it, it's too it's too simple to just say that everything should be lovely all the time. And you are always amazing because you're a good person all the time. We have good mm. days, we have bad days, but doing it mm. with a group of people who aren't going to reject you uh, mm. because of your your bad days uh, and are going to help you. Uh, even even when you're feeling the worst. I think that's that's what I found really lucky, you know, from my point of view. And I guess leading this on, like, you know, mental health is such a big uh, a, a big issue these days. And, and you know, not only is there the financial stress of, um, you know, an incredibly expensive world, uh, but there is also this purpose problem. You know, it's like, well, we don't need any more people doing these jobs, you know? So actually I would like to go off and, and follow my my dream of being a creative. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, you know, doing that without a group of friends who are similar minded, I don't think I'd I'd have the strength to do that. And I think I know through, a, you know, through some of the people who are doing this by themselves, that it is incredibly mentally draining, you know, exhausting on 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 people. So, I mean, how how have you found uh, sort of that keeping keeping mentally fit, keeping keeping positive? Uh, I mean, again, I'll, transparency, I'm I, I struggle everyone struggles i mean i think that when you are a creative person you make a decision in the way that your life goes i mean i've got uh three siblings and all of them have got more traditional career paths than me which obviously makes me go like oh how how do they, they know where their rent's coming from they know what their situation you know, where how they're you know moving forward they're, they're planning for the year you know i think that especially the state of the industry at the moment it's it's a scary time and i think that you've when it comes to mental health, I think exactly as you said, it, it's it's having those groups around you that really understand why you're doing things and, 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 and really help you through those difficult times. Now, I, you know, I'm very lucky also that I have parents that are super supportive. You know, my both my parents really understand that this is everything I want to do. I, I don't want to get to a point in my life where I regret the choices that I've that I've made or that I didn't make, or that I didn't try hard enough. And I think that I'm, I know that I could do a whole load of different types of jobs, but this is the one that gives me the most fulfillment uh, out of anything that I can think of. And I think that um, you made a really interesting point, which is saying like, like society says that there are enough of you. And I think that that's, that does, society doesn't really account for the individual though. You know, you are an individual still, even if you're saying, you know, in society saying, oh, there's enough of you. Go like, well, this is all I want to do. And I think if you deprive, you know, uh, deprive yourself that as an individual, you will feel uh, really um, disgruntled. And it can lead to things like, you know, you have those people that have those big midlife crises and, and big thinking that, oh, God, I, I made a mistake. I should have gone off and done the thing that I loved. And I was was scared and I was afraid to go off and do those things because of the pressures of society mm. now if you can try and find a way of of accepting who you are and who you want to be and then going off and trying to do that 
you know, I, I, I can say from my side as somebody who is pursuing that, I, I, I have days that go like this, but I don't have, as, I don't have a life that's like that for me. I can have some of the highest highs and I can feel super proud, but I also know with that comes a bit of a peak and trough. So it depends on the tempo of life you choose, but, um, but yeah, I'm, um, mental, mental health is, is, is a funny thing. I think you, you it, it, as I said, it is a day to day thing that you can do things to try and, you know, impact that you can try and be as active and eat well and, and, you know, have good people around you. And I, for me, I know that I need my creativity. When I'm when I'm firing creatively, it makes me feel like I can very easily just jump into another world that I can create, which helps me deal with the, the world that we're in. <laughs> yeah, 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 definitely. It's funny you talk about the the, the conventional career path, and yeah, the, it, it it does seem like when you're a filmmaker, you're resetting after every single project. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, unlike sort of building on the corporate ladder, like, no, no, you start from scratch every time you do this. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, you know, you, you climb a bit further up this ladder this time. But the moment you finish a project, it's like, oh, you know, and I think you, you've you warned me about this. Because obviously, for, for me, Sunrise is a short film that I've been working on for four years. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so it's like I, I do have a lot of association and personal sort of uh, emotion tied into this film. And, you know, am I am I trying to make it not end? Well, I don't think it's that, you know, but I am I scared of it being over? Yeah, kind of, you know, so what? Yeah, and, really I, and, and, I'm, and I can completely identify with that. I think, you know, it's um, I think creativity, I think uh, I, I want it to feel like for you that you that you have. There are so many more things that you can make. I think that this is this is and I think it has been something that has been there for a long time and you really wanted to make it as good as you can uh, do and really have put yourself in a position where you where you want to make the best film you can and find resource to help that film happen. Um I I as I said I think you know I really subscribe to the fact that filmmaking is a craft in the same way that it's as pottery as drawing as whatever and I think that you know there will always there will be actors, there will be locations, there will be camera, you know, there'll be sound. But all of these things that they're always going to exist for other projects. And I think that this one, uh, Sunrise, is going to be a, a wonderful film. But yeah, I think it's being able to know that it's also not the end of the world if it's if if it doesn't do exactly what we want because we then get to go off and make more things and learn and grow and be creative. So, yeah, I think letting go of something is. I mean, I the same with Vestige. You know, we we were. I was in post-production for a long time because there was um, as, as, as some CG elements in there mm. that were really difficult to to achieve, uh, which took a long time, and which felt felt like it was dragging on a bit longer, which may, meant that I couldn't go off and do the things that it has done now sooner, which I which, which I would have you know liked because then it helps me go down the path sooner. But I think it's just realizing actually the whole idea of time and, and feeling like something needs to happen now is also an impatience thing that just like mm. you know it's <laughs> it's difficult it, you, there is it's a journey you know it's not it's not a you're not you're not getting there and you're not going to get that sense of it um finality of achievement when whenever you make something as you said you're you are at square one when you do finish a project because it's a project-based industry you know you take your craft to each individual project and then you find and you discover something in each one so yeah i think that's that's the kind of the life that we signed up for um mm. Mm. well i mean i have to say it's a roller coaster my friend and uh you know i can't quite figure out right now whether i'm having a mental health crisis or if i'm just in post-production uh mm. because um you know one minute you watch your film and you're like oh my god this is amazing you know you start to see how the audience are going to feel and the next minute you're like oh this is shit <laughs> like what am i doing <laughs> oh but again i think when you when you watch things and, and i think what's what's very interesting as a as a as a filmmaker finishing the thing that you're making is the you know You've seen it so many times when when uh, when you finished it that actually it doesn't even it doesn't belong to you when you've finished it because the people that are going to experience it fresh are the people that are going to have that experience. You can't watch your film anymore in a way that anybody would watch your film. 
it's you're watching and you're seeing oh that did we did we remove those two or three frames at the end of that shot or did we uh why did we use that sound design bit what's happening in the mix there like you can't separate from when you've been working through each individual problem problem um to try and find a way to get it to how it feels best for you um because you're always going to be looking for something because it's um it's it is like you know you've got you know when you've when you've got the footage that you want you know it's a ball of clay you throw and then you're figuring out where the shape is in the ball of clay um and you're always going to want to fiddle because that's what happens whenever you make something when you when something is done it's very difficult to say you know what i mean i just have the same experience where i'd gone through the process of you know gone all the way through the process of, of making a film and then i decided that i didn't like what it had become so then i went in back into the edit and then i went to go get stuff back and recut and just finishing mixing and grading now and it's um but yeah sometimes you you got to know when to stop but also you, you've got to also know when you want to dig your heels in and fight for the creative thing that you wanted to make amazing man i really like that yeah people will only ever look at the finished sculpture they don't see mm. what the sculpture went through to do it and that's a, yeah that's a and really you, nice and way what to try and do is smooth off where you've made your your marks uh but sometimes it's actually great to just see and and again craft wise if you look at somebody that's made a film and you can really feel the sense of it being handmade i made a film with one of our uh, mates um foreign silver uh and uh he came to my house christmas time and we made a little film on a small camera that really feels like you can see the edges in the way that it's been made and i liked the idea of going back to a different type of craft where you know it went back to the the, the first type of filmmaking that i had which was really kind of roaming around with a with an slr equivalent of and just going and telling a story very quickly with the tools at my disposal in my hands whereas i've been in kind of the, the last few projects i've had a lot of a bigger cruise and, and more of a sense of kind of traditional kind of practice but yeah going off and making and seeing where things feel rough and being like that's also a part of the process as well is is really fun it's amazing uh mentally draining but um okay well let's uh let's let's talk uh about your shittest film um you know there's 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 60 films out there somewhere um what would you say the the worst film is uh, oh. and and be brutally honest with with you know just because it won't even be available if the oh, audience yeah. is expecting to find it they're not going to find it anywhere no, no, no. burned buried blown up uh yeah. hid from the world what is that project that, that I mean, you... again you probably think it's probably the first project that you make you know what i mean it's it's what the first that? time i i was an actor in uh, i went and did a study abroad semester in melbourne and i was there for six or seven months and while i was acting in uh plays there um i was very i was very lucky the head of the theater was like will you you know, what do you want to do? And I said, oh, well, I think in a click moment, I was like, I think I'd like to make films, but I don't know how to do that. And it's just like, actually, I've got a friend of mine who said they'll, they'll meet you. And then I met this guy who was from Birmingham, who lived in Melbourne, just gave me his camera, gave me his camera. Uh, I then shot something in a park. It's very funny, actually. Silly story. So my, uh, I was in a play with a guy called Charlie Willis. Now, Charlie Willis, it was the first, uh, it was actually in the first film that I'd ever made. And he is uh, now uh, in the Lord of the Rings TV show uh, as Sauron. So he plays Sauron in, uh, <laughs> in that. Oh, and he was, from your he was first show. First, he was in my first film. <laughs> and he was, a, he was a clown. So we dressed him up as a clown. He read a poem that I had written and performed it in a series of uh, locations in Melbourne. And that was a like he did a great job. I made a terrible film that I was like when I was twenty or twenty one on, and I thought, oh God, I'm, I'm going to make, it. I'm going to be a filmmaker. And you don't know what you don't know until you you know that you don't know it. Uh, <laughs> and so I made I made a terrible film. Uh, and my throughout my filmmaking journey, I've, I've, as as I've started to get a bit better, I'd, I'd always show them to my parents as well. My parents would watch those some of the early films. And my mum would be like, I don't really understand what you're doing. I don't understand what's happening. And as 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 my as my mum has she's my good litmus test. Because even if 
it's something that she may not understand. It goes, oh, wow, I was, I really, uh, there was, there were parts of it that I really enjoyed. Uh, at the beginning of my filmmaking process, my mom was like, I, I don't know. I don't I don't know whether this was a smart decision for you to make, Joe. I think maybe you should just go and get a normal job. Uh, but as, as it started to become slightly more validating, she can go, oh, okay, there is something there. Absolutely. That's that's an amazing story, man. And and, and it's just a testament to you, really, because like, you know, you don't not only do you don't give up, but you don't stop. You know, you you are you are such a um, a fast paced creative. And I, I really I really want to. I mean, I don't know if I'll ever be able to catch up with you. Uh, you're you're like the Ridley Scott of 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 my friends. Like you you produce films so quickly and get and and get not only that like, but you get so many more stories out than the average person. I think your your brain is must be full of stories. How do you even how do you even keep all these ideas? Um, I love I, ideas are uh the best currency in the world, in my opinion. I think it's such an amazing thing. I my fiance is constantly so irritated because I have got an ideas um, document on my phone and I am forever just going, oh, that's fun. And then I'll be writing it down in the middle of the night. It's on the side of the, like, oh, can't go to sleep. I've got something else going. So I think for me, that's always been my, I've been very lucky in the fact that um, lots of my creativity has come from building story worlds and what if questions. Mm -hmm. And then from there, uh, I just, I followed that through. So all the way through, um, you know, starting as an actor when I was like 13, 14. But even before that, I was creating games with my brothers and my sisters and playing and making story worlds and, you know, drawing and all that sort of stuff. I'd always, I was just a creative person. I was very lucky to have that, um, that propensity nurtured by my parents. Uh, my dad, uh, right, you know, is, a, is an eye doctor, but he also writes screenplays. My my mom was a pharmacist initially, but she's now a textile artist and she's she's brilliant herself. So I've been very lucky to have people in my corner that have pushed me to be creative uh, and and haven't made that feel like a, a, a you know a terrible decision. Mm. Um, what well, sorry, I've completely won. What was the question again? Uh, ideas. Uh, where oh, no, ideas? Obviously, the, 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 I I I know I know about your 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 habit of writing ideas down. You can't you can't keep his attention without him suddenly just being. And you think he's being rude. He's like he's like texting someone. But he's actually just writing, you know, down something that triggered an idea uh, that you just like, yeah, better, better. I mean, and, but that's but again, like, for for example, so what I so the, the to read back to Vestige, uh, that all came from a little what if question that came from what would it be like if a if a, a, a boy found a fossilized alien? What would a fossilized <laughs> alien look like? And, that, and you that's, thought, you know what? I got the money to make that. That sounds yeah, genius. Yeah. I mean, and it, but again, I think what is the I think because I have lots of those ideas, and then you think actually that is a good idea, and then you start mm. to really interrogate an idea. And I've, again, I've been very lucky to have people validate the taste that I have cultivated and go, that's actually it is a good idea, mm. um, which is a lovely thing because you spend lots of time as a creative in your own world thinking like I find this interesting and I think this is fun but then when you you can pitch it to somebody and you understand why you think it's fun and why you think it's good and I realize actually that's a big part of what it means to be a creative communicator which is I have found that it gives me the, the thing that I want to make feel authentic to me and I know how I want, I want to make it and I know why it's important and I think what why I think people would want to see it and I have that belief and I've cultivated the project with that belief, and then I can talk to somebody, and then it get, then it can it resonates. So I've been I've been very lucky to have um, people go, yeah, I I really like the sound of that story. So um, yeah, I'm just I, when it comes to ideas, I just love making things. Joe Simmons, you are a legend. Thank you very very much for talking to me today on Cam Talks. We are going to have to do a couple of these in the future, quite 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 a lot more actually, um, because I'm very interested in your career and I want to grow with you, learn with you, and uh, and hopefully I will be with you uh, and mate, your lovely fiance. Wait, mate, we'll see you, we'll see you very very soon, and I, I completely ditto. It's a uh, it's a pleasure to have uh, a creative like you in my life. Just quickly, where can people find out more about you and your life? Uh, people can find out more about me and my life 
uh, what website? So uh, josephsimmons.co.uk um, on Instagram, which is uh, Joe Simmons Filmmaker as my handle. Yeah. Check him to... out. Check him well, out. Really. All right. All right. 